So when we lose it with our kids, um, you know, we, we literally lose it. We lose our awareness. That's what's happening. We don't set out to be a jerk. We don't set out to say that thing that we always said we would never say. We lose our cool. We lose our senses. We lose our way. Hello and welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast, where each week we talk about ideas for raising kids who become thriving adults. I'm your host, Audrey Monkey. Here on the podcast, I share my experiences raising five kids who currently range in age from 16 to 26 and working with thousands more as a summer camp director over the past three decades. I'm the author of Happy Campers, and I frequently do workshops with parents, teachers, and summer camp professionals about social skills, connection, and happiness, topics I researched extensively for my master's in psychology. If you want tools for raising kind, optimistic, self-reliant kids who become thriving adults, you've come to the right place. Hey, Sunshine Parenting listeners, and welcome to episode 158, which is being released on Friday, September 25th, 2020. This week's One Simple Thing tip comes from my book, Happy Campers. It's a sticky note solution. What is something that you really appreciate about your kid? Let them know that you notice and appreciate them by leaving an encouraging sticky note on their pillow or bathroom mirror or in a book. The note can say something like, your great sense of humor makes my days happier, or thank you for doing the dishes without being asked. I appreciate how you help our home run smoothly. Our kids frequently hear about what they're doing wrong and how they're falling short. Getting a positive message about a way they make your day better or how they are contributing to the family can really build them up. I'm excited to announce that after four years and more than 100,000 downloads of the podcast, I've created a way to connect with those of you who consider yourself Sunshine Parenting superfans and get some financial support to offset some of my costs producing the podcast. It's a win-win. For as little as $5 per month, you'll get bonus podcast episodes that I'm creating just for you. You'll also have access to many exclusive posts and resources. For October, Patreon members will be able to listen to or download a compilation of 30 of my favorite One Simple Thing tips. Thank you for considering joining my Patreon squad and a big shout out to my first three supporters who jumped on board just as soon as I announced the opportunity. Thank you to Kate, Brina, and Sarah for being my original Patreon squad. Check the link in the show notes if you want to join us. My guest on the podcast this week is Bethany Saltman. Bethany is an author, award-winning editor, and researcher. Her work has been in The New Yorker, New York Magazine, Atlantic Monthly, Parents, and many other publications. Bethany also works as a best-selling book coach, a communications director, and an in-demand mindfulness mentor, consulting writers and entrepreneurs at all stages of their creative process. In 1992, Bethany graduated from Antioch College, where she was one of the architects of the nation's first affirmative consent policy. She went on to receive her MFA in poetry from Brooklyn College in 1994, where she studied with Allen Ginsberg. In 2020, Antioch awarded Bethany the Rebecca Rice Award for Achievement in Profession. A longtime student of Zen, Bethany is devoted to the fine art and game-changing effects of paying attention. She lives in a small town in the Catskills with her family. In our conversation today, Bethany and I talk about her brand new book, Strange Situation, A Mother's Journey into the Science of Attachment. Welcome to the podcast, Bethany. Thanks for having me. I am just can't even tell you how excited I am to have you on. I Your book, Strange Situation, a mother's journey into the science of attachment is a masterpiece. Oh, that's so nice. 
I, I honestly haven't read anything like it. I can't even really remember. What you've done is you've woven together a really cool combination of your personal narrative and some really important information that we can all use. So why don't you just talk first about, about how you came to write this book? Sure. So uh, my daughter, Azalea, who is now 14, um, when she was born, I loved her like crazy. I you know, thought she was adorable and I loved the way she smelled and you know, her little toes and all that stuff. So that was all working. But at the same time, I still found myself getting impatient, frustrated, angry. And, um, you know, like so many women, I had had this idea that once I was a mother, I was actually going to become a different person. And in fact, I became more of myself, edgy, complicated, irritable. And I thought, this can't be right. Um, this flies in the face of everything I've always thought about <clears throat> maternal, you know, the maternal gaze. I must be broken. And there must be something wrong with me because this doesn't match any of my expectations. And so I was um, a writer and a researcher at the time, and I, I was writing a column on being a Buddhist mother, which I am. And I had an opportunity to um, write this column every month and, and sort of wrestle with a lot of the um, parenting material, you know, that was coming through and on the, on the internet and stuff. And I started to read about attachment that was markedly different from the Dr. Sears attachment parenting that I had learned about when Azalea was first born, which I immediately felt I did not like. And I felt like this can't be right. We can't have to follow a checklist of behaviors to raise a human being. Um, I felt very much ashamed by him because he talks about how it's natural for mothers to respond in a certain way. I and mean, he really says that again and again. And so then I started to read about attachment and this strange situation. And this woman named Mary Ainsworth, who came up with this strange situation, which is a laboratory procedure that, that um, helps people observe and kind of understand the attachment relationship between babies and mothers. And I started to, my interest was peaked and I just wanted to know everything there was about it. Um, my background is as a poet, I have an MFA in poetry. And the strange situation really struck me as this incredible poem and like a love story. And I wanted to know more about it. And so I went on this 10 year journey into the science of attachment and to discover what kind of mother I was. Oh my gosh. And, and, and really like, I love, like, even in the book, it's like almost like your relationship with Mary Ainsworth is so cool. How, even though you didn't get to meet her, yeah. you got to delve into all of her research. Okay. Well, I have so many things to unpack. First of all, what is, when you say being a Buddhist parent, yeah. what does that mean? Well, it can be lots of different things for different people. For me, it means I've been a Zen practitioner. By the time Azalea was born, oh, I don't know, like 10 years or so, I had lived in a monastery. I met my husband in a monastery. So it was very much a part of my life. I you know, pretty much sat on a cushion every day for you know, 20, 30 minutes and meditated and was deeply um, identified with that practice. And it really saved my life, quite literally. And I talk about that in the book a bit. And, um, and so being a Buddhist parent was really a practice of an exercise in trying to um, come to terms with this idea of myself. Like I'm supposed to be, you know, I'm imagining one of the reasons why you're asking that question is because we think of Buddhism as this very calm, you know, especially Zen. Everybody thinks like, oh, it's so Zen. But in fact, you know, when you really practice and you really look closely at your mind, you see what chaos the world is in, including yourself. So, you know, to be a Buddhist mother, I also had this idea that I was supposed to know how to work with my mind and that I shouldn't let the train out of the station as often as I did. But I, you know, I was what I was. And, and so the column was really about kind of rectifying um, some of those issues. Did you start the column before Azalea was born or after? No, I was asked to start when she was six months old. And then I stopped when she was like seven. Oh. So I did it for a long time. Okay. And where was this column? It's available on my website. Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's called Flowers Fall. Okay. And it was in a local arts journal called um, Chronogram. Okay. And it was, it was an amazing experience. I loved, I loved it so much. 
That was really the beginning of the book. Yeah. Well, okay. That's wonderful. Well, I love, so that's where by writing the column and getting these thoughts out and getting probably the feedback from people that it was resonating with so many people, I'm sure that really helped you. And I will say, reading your book, I think will resonate with a lot of people. Um, so my listeners probably remember I had Tina um, Payne Bryson on earlier this year talking about the power of showing up, which is like a nonfiction book talking about adult attachment and how that relates yeah. to our parenting and how, you know, even if you didn't have a secure attachment as a child, it's not too late. You can like kind of make this cohesive narrative. So I think like that yeah. book together with your book are so good for people who are struggling with perhaps either feeling like they're getting that kind of attachment they want with their child or, or thinking back that they didn't feel like they got what they needed when they were young. Is that kind of, does that make, does that kind of resonate? Yeah. yeah. Tina is incredible. I love her. And um, Dan Siegel, who she has co-written many books with, he wrote the foreword to my book. And so I, they're so smart and they've, they've got everything right. They're really, they know what they're talking about, obviously. And so, I mean, I would be flattered, honored to be coupled with them. I think that, you know, they really know the science in such a deep way. And I am a beginner with the science, but I, you know, I delved deep into it. I taught myself a lot, but um, that's not my background. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a clinician. I'm a poet. I'm a Zen student. I'm a mother and I'm a writer. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, my story is about how I learned that attachment, secure attachment is not what I thought it was. And it's much bigger. It's much more forgiving. Um, it's really much more empowering than Dr. Sears would ever have you think. And that I ever could have imagined. And it's much bigger and deeper and just juicier. <laughs> oh, for sure. I really <laughs> like how you talk about, I think this is a really true thing. So if you grow up in a family, oftentimes you and your siblings don't reflect the same way on the parenting, the childhood, your family. And I've often said that, but you gave really good explanation for that about how it's not really exactly what happens. It's our perception right. and kind of how we've interpreted how, you know, what was going on. And so it's so much, I, I love that explanation. And it's why as a parent, like I have five kids, Oh, my each, of their, You're each of their experience is going to be, they're going to have different memories of our family, our relationship, you know, all these things because of them being their own person with their own perceptions of things. So one question I have, you talk a lot about your childhood and, um, you know, it sounds like they're, there were some interesting things. It, like to me, as I was reading it, I was thinking, oh, Beth, Bethany was this very sensitive, <laughs> empathic. Um, like I, this is what I got from it. Yeah. You were this very observant, empathic, sensitive child. Very. In a home where people didn't really see the you. Like it was like that's kind good. of brushing off. Is that a good interpretation? Uh, yeah, I could, I would say so. Sure. I mean, my mother saw me, but she didn't see me as deeply as I wanted to be seen. So how does your mother feel about the way she's depicted in your book? Cause I know that's always a problem. And a lot of reason why a lot of people who write about parenting or nonfiction things on these topics kind of stay away from, you know, throwing anyone under the bus, so to speak. Right. Um, how does your mom feel about your book? Well, it's been the source of many, many conversations, which I attest to the fact that she is so amazing and so secure. And so even though things were not ideal for me growing up, um, one of the things that, that my journey into the science of attachment taught me is that secure, and a secure attachment doesn't mean that you're always going to be happy and that you're going to feel connected all the time. Um, what it does is it poises you to be able to take full advantage of your environment and it poises you to be, you know, resilient is the word of the day. Um, but it, but it, it sort of positions you or orients you toward love, toward, um, attachment, toward, toward relationship. And my mother's love of me absolutely did that for me. Now she, you know, has read the book many times and, um, she is, 
very upset by a lot of the depictions in the book. And, and she hates the, the reviews have always said they, the reviews always say things like Saltman's, you know, quote, cold and distant mother. And that just kills her. She's like, Oh my God. And, and what I say to her is mom, if Azalea wrote a book about me and called me cold and distant, I would feel like I dodged a bullet, you know, like it could have been a lot worse. So let's call a spade a spade. Like there was some cold, there was some cold distance there. And I'm sorry if you don't feel that way, you didn't see it that way, but this is my experience. And on top of it, you really come out as the hero of the book. Many people have said that you haven't gotten to the end yet, but it, it takes a very happy turn. And okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's good. No, and I did, I don't think I said be, before we started recording, I mentioned to you that I am diving in as per usual. I procrastinated. I was talking to you today. I started reading yesterday and I'm at what page 130, chapter 18. And I am so loving this book that I'm going to finish it tonight. I'm oh, sure. I can't wait. You have to email me. I want to know the end of the, the and that's what we talked about before is like what the, and I, I but it, it was interesting because already like your mom's been, you know, visiting you and checking in and there's been some already some, I can see that she's involved, very involved and, and exactly. wants to be part of your life. But I think that's also a struggle. I feel for her too, because there's also this whole thing and you talk about this is that we all are born with kind of our own innate kind of personalities and strengths. Okay. Yep different things. And we bring those into all of our relationships, including our relationship with our kids. Yeah, for sure. And, and sometimes even if we're doing like something that's maybe fine with one kid and they are like, oh yeah, my mom's fine. Another child is going to perceive that as not, not what they needed at that time. Right. For sure. For sure. But attachment security goes beneath whether or not you're getting what you need all the time. And um, generally speaking, siblings have the same kind of attachment in a family um, because it's the parents, the primary caregivers attachment pattern that's being passed down for the most part. Now, this is not always true, but, you know, in terms of just like the meta analysis of the situation, that's generally the case. It has a propensity to um, continue down the line, one's, uh, the, the adult's attachment pattern. Um, you know, but that's the beautiful thing about this work is that it really directs us so much deeper than um, those sort of superficial feelings of like, I like this, I don't like that. Um, this person pleases me, this person doesn't please me. It's, it's a very, very primitive kind of orientation towards security and towards safety that is so primitive in our bodies, in our um, brains, in our souls, if you will, that um, that's why the AAI, the adult attachment interview, is just this incredible, it's like a religious tool that really helps us look at karma and the strange situation also. Um, so that's, you know, because I'm a Buddhist, I'm looking at the science from that perspective. And so while we would, you know, people say this to me all the time, you know, well, you, that's easy for you to say because you only have one kid and me, you know, so-and-so might have three or four kids and they're all so different. And I don't always say this, but I think it, you may think your kids are really different, but from what I'm seeing, they're, they're similarly um, attached, you know, like there's a similar propensity, there's a similar orientation. And that's the deeper thing that we're talking about. Yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense. And I can see that being the case. Um, one of the things, well, before I also want to like, I, I'm going to, I'm going to argue with you against you being an expert on attachment. So oh. when you were talking before and saying that because you don't have a specific degree, honestly, all the things that you've done, the workshop to understand how to code that, the adult yeah, attachment yeah, inventory, yeah, yeah. the, um, the spending, months pouring over all of Mary Ainsworth's work. I mean, you, you have made yourself an expert and this is one of those things like in your book, honestly, the, you have, you've referred to the people doing some of the scientific research and what they found. So you have compiled for those of us who are lay people being a lay person yourself, what you've done is translated for us a very good description of what this all means. So Bethany, one of the things that I was, when I read about attachment, you know, you start kind of delving into your own, you know, and kind of your own history and thinking about it more 
like closely. What do you recommend for adults who kind of read your book or start thinking about these things and are wondering about their own? Yeah. Um, what, what is your recommendation? Like what's the first step that we should take if we want to spend a little more time thinking about whether or not we did have that secure attachment as a child and what our current attachment style is in our adult relationships? Right. Yeah, lots of people ask that and want to know. I always say that it really, in a sense, it doesn't matter because wherever we are now, um, the work is always the same. It's to see the thought gently and compassionately let it go and return to the moment. So when we lose it with our kids, um, you know, we, we literally lose it. We lose our awareness. That's what's happening. We don't set out to be a jerk. We don't set out to say that thing that we always said we would never say. We lose our cool. We lose our senses. We lose our way. And, and so, you know, I remember so many times, or not so many times, but a few times after a really just bitterly terrible moment with my beautiful daughter and the remorse and the, oh my God, you know, just shaking with like, I can't believe I did that. And all you can do is forgive yourself and, and, and take the next breath because it doesn't matter. Now, if you're, if you're truly an avoidant, you know, if you really got avoidant patterns, it's going to be more difficult for you to do that. And, and if you're very preoccupied as an adult, it will also be more difficult, but the work is exactly the same. So, well, so I actually, this is really, yeah, I think it's really helpful. I, I think a lot of parents have that feeling of- Like we all have to do the same thing, but if you're really avoidant or if you're really preoccupied, those are the two adults, you know, or dismissing rather than avoidant when you're an adult. If those- if you were to get your AAI done, and most people won't ever, but if you were, then um, and you found out that you were dismissing or or preoccupied, it would be more difficult for you. It may be more difficult for you to return to the moment in that way, but that is still what we all have to do. Developing mentalization, developing mind sight, developing awareness of ourselves as people, as people with minds. That's what mentalization means. That is what creates a secure attachment in our babies and our children. So repeat again the steps. So what we're supposed to do, like we, we do something or we say something or we're like having this bad feeling or whatever. What are the steps that we take to kind of be zen, get back in our moment? How do we do that? So, so let's say we um, lose it, right? And you say the thing that you never thought in a million years you'd say. Um, the reason why you were able to do that is because your awareness was offline. You lost your mind. You were not in your senses. And so the antidote to that is to return to your mind and return to your senses. This is difficult to do when we are activated um, because rage activates our system. It's, you know, the fight, flight, freeze thing. Um, and so, you know, the first thing to do is to try, whenever possible, try to stop talking. <laughs> this is what I say to myself. Just try to stop talking. And, and then, you know, allow for whatever is happening to continue to happen. The child's crying, um, you know, your heart's racing, the TV's on when you wanted it off, whatever it is to just let anything happen, stop talking. And in time, you know, your senses will return. You can come back to yourself. You can take a deep breath. My husband, who's a somatic experiencing psychotherapist, um, gives a great tip, which is to orient, like actually physically look around the room. That does wonders. There's something about moving the neck that really brings us back to ourselves. And then we can take a deeper breath. And then, um, and that's literally coming to our senses. And then, you know, we'll, we'll continue to have thoughts like, I can't believe I did that. And we'll, maybe we'll beat ourselves up or maybe we'll mentally beat the kid up or whatever it is. And, and all of those thoughts um, that we, quote, don't want to have, we need to just notice them. This is the meditation, um, you know, exercise. The meditation instruction is notice the thought, gently let it go, 
and return to the present moment. Return to your body. Return to your breath. Oh, return to your intention of being a kind and attuned parent. And all of the stuff that comes up around, I suck, I suck, I'm mad, I'm mad. You just be patient with it. The way your best self would be with a baby, you know, because that's what's going on inside of you in that moment. You're like an angry baby. And you're not, you can't regulate yourself, so you can't regulate your kids. So we have to, you know, give some space around ourselves, return to ourselves. And over time, this develops mind sight. We are able to see our, our reactions as they happen. This is what we develop in meditation. This is awareness. This is mindfulness. This is, you know, being in the moment, all the ways you want to talk about that. And there are other, you know, more direct ways to learn how to do that. Learning how to meditate is incredibly helpful. Um, you know, you want to really help your kids learn to meditate because it will help them. Um, you know, therapy is a great way to learn mentalization because it's just learning to track your own thoughts instead of being a victim to the mind storm. Um, so, you know, these are all the kinds of things that um, Dan Siegel and, and Tina talk about. And, you know, there's only one way. That's, that's all there is to this attachment stuff. Just like be aware of your mind. Well, so, okay. Regardless of your childhood, yeah. you know, regardless of what you have to, whatever, regardless of what you're bringing into the mix, that's the solution. So it doesn't really matter if you're, you know, avoidant or resistant or whatever. Gotcha. So the, so whatever you can kind of, if you don't want to delve deep into your past and we're, or think more about maybe some un, things that weren't good from your childhood, you, you don't really need to as long as you are very aware of what you're doing right now and how you're reacting and maybe things that are triggering you. I mean, I love how when you explain that, I just keep thinking of Daniel Siegel's flipping your lid. And I feel like we taught our campers at camp that, and it was so effective and it was so funny yeah. because uh, when I gave the introduction, I go, you know how like sometimes like maybe your, you know, your parent or something just like suddenly gets really upset and kind of like yeah. whatever I go, or you like get really mad at something and you do something. And afterwards you're like, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Yeah. I go, we call yeah, that yeah, yeah. flipping your lid. And so we talked with the kids about it and it so resonated with them. And it was such a relief, I think for all of us to know, and this is what your book also is a relief for parents to know that this happens I think to everybody, I don't think there's anyone out there who's just like oh, Zen, please. staring at their baby, uber, you know, feeling peaceful all the time. Um, you talk a little bit about like postpartum depression and, and that, yeah. and that's a very real thing that I, I know so many people. And that adds just another layer to, yeah. you know, the guilt, the shame that I'm not, I'm broken. I can't do this. I'm not doing what I wanted to do. I had this vision that I was going to be this, this kind of mom right. or dad. And then now the reality is just so different. Um, yeah. so I think that's the other gift of your book is that it's just so real, like how we all do have that, those moments where we're just like, like you look at your kid and you're like, Oh my gosh, I don't even like this person right now. Yeah. And I mean, I always remember, yeah. And, and a friend of mine told me a story about when she was going to, um, it was like Valentine's day and she was looking for a card and she was so angry at her daughter. She couldn't find a card that would express how she felt because she didn't like her at all. And I was like, Oh my God, it was so such a gift for her to share that with me because this is someone I really respect. She has older kids. I thought she had it all together. And I was like, really? You were in the Hallmark section and you could not find a single card to, you know, that reflected how you felt because you were so mad at your teenage daughter. You know, I mean, I, I'm not there right now. Uh, Azalea and I are, get along great, but I'm, I'm prepared. You know, when she was younger, it was much more difficult for me. Yeah. I, I, I predict for you that you're going to have a lovely relationship throughout her teen years. Oh, I hope you're right. No, honestly, I, um, I, my daughters and I, um, we've, it was like, people always said, oh my gosh, three girls, it's going to be so chaotic. Um, actually I found it, um, 
we, we relate to each other because I could yeah. remember, you know, oh, yeah. how crazy it is and just, and um, just finding ways to connect and everything. But honestly, I just, um, it was, it was a really lovely time for us um, developing our relationship and the relationship changing into more of an adult, yeah. you know, just sort of um, being able to talk about more things, um, watching shows that we normally, you know, wouldn't, weren't allowed to before, but now we can debrief about them. Um, so there's a lot of really amazing things. And I I think that, um, in general and teenage boys as well. And this is one of the things I've learned through camp. I think adults have in general really kind of demonized teens as like, and they, they are people with, with lovely thing, you know, they are differentiating and becoming their own person. So yes, there's going to be sometimes tension because maybe something they decide to believe or, or do is contrary to what you do, but that doesn't need to change the fundamental relationship that you're, you know, your closeness. But um, so anyway, I just predict with the the intentionality that you have, Bethany, is just remarkable. And I, what I see more of, and I wonder what your perception is of parents right now, the every, I mean, a lot of parents are very anxious and also very distracted by like their phones, on their phones a lot. Yeah. Um, so now Azalea being 14, so in her earliest years, it was kind of pre-smartphone. Yeah. So well, I- That's not true. She- Really? Yeah. We had phones. She didn't get a phone until, I guess, um, eighth grade, I think. Mm-hmm. But I mean, for you as a parent, I mean, this is the thing, like for me, when my kids were little, yeah, like when you were maybe at the park with her right. when right. she was yeah. two or something, right. um, we as parents, I, I think it was easy. I will just say it's easy. It was easier for me when I didn't have those like other things that could also oh, yeah. be a reason to like- right turn my back. I did have my work and I really love my work. And so sometimes I really like, Oh, I want to be reading this or writing this email or doing this thing. And I had to really, and a lot of times I think my kids did see my back, honestly. And, and I, but I thought about it. I was like, I don't want on my tombstone that like my mom was always working. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I didn't. But what do you think about technology and like moms, like a, a young mom today, if you were talking to to a young, you know, mom starting out who's like immersed in all the technology and trying to be great and all this stuff. What's your advice to someone like that? Oh my gosh, you know, it's a mix because I, you know, and this may be an unpopular opinion, but I actually believe that we need to be held a little more accountable to our kids than a lot of people might want to hear. Um, I think our attachment systems, I know our attachment systems are incredibly forgiving. And, you know, when, when we're attuned to and we're taken care of, you know, these ruptures and repairs are just part of life. And so that's really okay. Um, but when we really sort of flagrantly um, are distracted from our children with our phones. I mean, I see, I, I'm kind of that person who has an opinion about that. I don't think it's okay. I, I never even, I rarely um, pushed Azalea in a stroller even because I just couldn't, I mean, I'm kind of, I, first of all, I hate gear of all kinds. So let's, you know, that's, that's a thing. Um, but also I just didn't really want to have her a- away from me. I wanted her with me. Now that's, that was me. And so I'm not saying that, you know, other people have to follow suit, but I definitely think that it's really important that we pay attention. What our children need more than anything is our attention and our attunement. It doesn't have to be perfect attention and it doesn't have to be perfect attunement. We have to at least, you know, it's so difficult to do at all. If we're not intentionally doing it, we have no chance. Uh, this is true, I think, too, in all of our relationships, Bethany. Agreed. I mean, this is the Agreed. the it's like the biggest gift we can give people right now is our full attention exactly. for a few minutes. Um, I it, yeah, that really resonated with me because one of the things that I often tell parents of kids, you know, mostly older kids, like maybe like Azalea's age in junior high, elementary, is at camp the counselors part of their job is checking in one on one with each of their campers at least once per day. And it's nothing, it does, it's not some huge, deep conversation. Right. It's really just a open-ended, hey, what's going on? How's your day going? Yeah. And is there anything I can do? Yeah. How are your friendships? Yeah. Yeah. 
just, and it's something where you're listening, you're looking at them, you're giving them full attention. And a lot of parents, what I tell them is, you know, you can go through many, many days where you're talking to your child a lot, you're nagging them about their homework, you're calling them for dinner, but you've never actually just like chatted and given them your full attention. Yeah. I bet when you hire people to do that, you're looking for someone who you can feel knows how to do that. And, and someone who knows how to talk to a child is someone who knows how to talk to themselves. And, you know, we, if we don't know how to attune to ourselves and ask ourselves, wow, Bethany, how are you feeling today? Like today was kind of a crazy day. You know, you've done some podcasts and the dogs keep coming in and out and you thought you turned your messengers off, but you didn't. And, you know, what is this person thinking? And, you know, it's been kind of a weird day. Hey, it's a weird life. Like this, this pandemic thing is getting to me. If you don't, if you can't relate to yourself in a gentle, loving, interested way, there is no way you can do it with your child. You may think you're doing it, but you're not. And so you're not enough. And so that's why I always tell people that it may seem like a waste of time or like you're being selfish or you're being self-absorbed by spending time with yourself and getting to know yourself. But actually, um, you know, and I'm not saying you should do that only for your children because you're a person, but if what you're concerned with is really making your child feel what you want them to feel, if you're really interested in that, take care of yourself. Oh my gosh. Amen to that. Honestly, in all ways, because if you're not, it reminded me of how like you really can't love other people unless you are loving yourself. Like if you are really telling yourself horrible things inside, um, how can you even have enough to give? So I, I love that. That explanation was so beautiful, Bethany. Oh my goodness. Well, where can my listeners find you, um, your book, your column? Um, what else are you doing right now? What's like, what's all your stuff? My stuff. Well, you can find me and all my stuff on my website, bethanysaltman.com. Um, you can buy my book there because it'll give you all the options. Um, you can always go to Amazon. Um, and I also, so I'm working on a second book of fiction a, a novel, which I'm really excited about. Um, I'm re it's very new, but, um, that's keeping me happy during this crazy COVID time. And I do book coaching, um, for authors. For oh my gosh. Yeah. Do you really? I do indeed. Yeah. Okay. That's so cool. I used a book coach when I wrote my book and it was the best experience of my life. Really? Ooh, we'll have to talk Jenny Nash. Do you know Jenny oh, Nash? I've heard of her. You... Yeah, absolutely. So she, um, yeah, Jenny Nash, who's um, she's a phenomenal book coach. She actually started a whole book coaching business oh, called Author Accelerator. I saw that. That's so. And funny. then she does like training for book coaches yeah. as well. Yeah. So how long have you been doing book coaching? I've been working with authors and creatives for a long time, um, and just since my book came out in April, I've decided, you know, I'm going to keep it really simple and I'm just going to go with book coaching because, you know, my book is out and people are asking me about books. The truth of the matter is I like to work with anybody on any kind of creative project. I bring in a lot of my um, mindfulness work from the monastery and, you know, just from my practice and really helping people harmonize inner and outer. So what do you want to say and how are you going to say it? And over the years, I have developed a large network of people who help people, you know, build your website, do your social, all that kind of stuff. And so um, I, I also work with people just one-on-one -on, -one on their writing because I used to be a writing teacher for a long time as well. So oh I, my gosh, that's so awesome. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, you'd be phenomenal because you are such a good writer. I mean, oh. you're, that's, like I said, reading your book, you are a phenomenal resource for Thank all things. You. Thank you. And you know, it's funny you bring up the... Um, the uh, coherent narratives that Tina talked about, and that's really what it's all about. So my learning about attachment has helped me really hone my work with authors in how to develop that coherent narrative, because that's, you know, that's what we all want to read, and that's what we're all yearning to write, whether it's through a book or just through the story of our lives as we live them. Amazing. Well, I'll put links to all of these things in the show notes so people can you. find you, whether they are wanting to write a book or do something else creative. Yeah. It sounds like you do it all. <laughs> I try. I try. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, um, and is your daughter at home school or is she out, able to go to school where you She's are? In a hybrid situation. She goes to a very small private school. And um, so she goes two days a week and she's home two days a week. Who knows? Oh, well, the, class. well, that's, you think, you think she's going to end up being back at home? Probably. Full-time? That's my guess. Which is fine. You know, I just, I, I, I was one of the only parents in the world who was sad when she went to, back to school. You know, I, yeah. I just love having her around. Well, it actually, I mean, for, for, depending on the age of your children, for very young children, I think it creates more chaos having them home all the time. But as your kids are older, I honestly think that with everything canceled and um, it actually made everything, you know, more time to have dinner together. Totally. People could sleep in more. I mean, there was just a lot of things that, that actually for some kids has been like increased their well being because yeah. they're yeah. better rested. Yeah. not as stressed, yeah. you know, everything. So it's interesting how some kids, and also some parents and also some kids have really thrived in the setting of, you know, less that needing to be out and about. Right. And that's an attachment thing. You mm-hmm. know? Most kids really just want to be near their parents, whether, regardless of what they say. Right. Um, you know, being with their parents, especially in such a scary time yes. is um, a really, yeah. they need safety and, and, and parents yeah. drive that. So it's, it's that secure base that you yeah. talk about a lot. Like you want to make sure your home and you are a place that even, and I think about this because I have adult children. I want to still be that place, totally. you know, down the road. Like if they're having a hard day, you know, yeah, call me. I'm here. <laughs> you know, like We don't have to talk all the time. And I know you're very independent in doing your own life, but when it, when you're going through something, I'm always here. It's the base. You can always come back. Do you need to come home for a weekend and hang out? You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That is a life changing yeah. experience to have that in the world makes it so that you can go out and explore and take risks. Absolutely. Well, Bethany, this has been such a pleasure. I just want to keep talking to you because I feel like more Zen just after talking to you. I'm kind of inspired. I, I've used the calm app before and I do like journaling and prayer. Oh, so I have my own little like practice. Um, but I've always been really intrigued because to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, like Buddhism or Buddhist practice can be paired with kind of any religion. Is oh, that absolutely. True? That's not, because it's not more, of, it's a, it's a practice that you can tie in That's with exactly right. whatever else you do or don't and believe. Whatever you believe. Yeah. So just love it. I am so thrilled that Tina introduced us. So me too. she's amazing. I know. So Bethany, thank you so much for being on. We'll have to do this again sometime um, for sure before your next book comes out or after we'll, we'll talk, uh, yeah. talk some more. Awesome. Thank you so much. As always, you can find notes, links, and other resources related to today's conversation by visiting my website at sunshine-parenting.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for my email list so that you don't miss out on any of the great resources I have available for raising thriving kids. If you enjoyed this episode and appreciate the podcast, there are a few ways that you can help me out. One is by sharing this episode with a friend who you think might enjoy it. Another way you can support Sunshine Parenting is by leaving a review on iTunes. Reviews are very important for helping podcasts find their audiences, and I would love your support in helping people find Sunshine Parenting. My favorite for this week is a book by Bob Buford called Halftime, Moving from Success to Significance. If you're anywhere from your late 30s into your 50s, You've probably had some moments where you've wanted to step back and think about what you want to do with the rest of your life. Just like how football teams regroup and reassess their approach for the second half during a football game, Buford urges us to do the same for our lives. I especially like the list of questions that Bob encouraged us to ask ourselves during our halftime, including, what do I want to be remembered for? Where do I look for inspiration, mentors, and working models for my second half? And what do I want for my children? I've recorded a much longer review of the book, and you can access it in the show notes for this episode. But I encourage you to check out Halftime by Bob Buford. Let's end with a quote from my book, Happy Campers. 
Creating a close and connected family culture that promotes positive, lifelong relationships is the most important thing we can do for our children. Warm and supportive parent-child relationships, a sense of being loved, and help and support from family members serve as protective factors and increase children's resilience and their ability to face many of life's inevitable challenges. I'm Audrey Monkey. Thank you for joining me for the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. Join me again next week for more conversations about raising kids who become thriving adults.